Good morning. And happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. And we hope you have a beautiful day of celebration. And um, it is good to see a wonderful family that was here at the church for a few years before they packed up and went to North Carolina. And so the Woodwards are uh, visiting with us today. And uh, so and they, and they've added, they've added one, actually two. Right, so you've got Caleb and Israel. So Caleb's added, and they were married, and now um, they're expecting their first child in October. Right, Israel? So, so that is fantastic. And we, we miss Cole and Jake, but uh, I, I was sharing with, um, with Joel, yeah, with Joe, with Joe and JV back here. I see the pictures, and I, I'm astounded by how uh, tall JV is getting. And, uh, and Cole, he's, I mean, he's bulking right up there, so uh, doing construction work. So it's so glad to see you here, and Jared, and, uh, and welcome. It's always a joy when you come back and visit with us. We miss you, but uh, we're glad you're thriving where you are. And um, also for Anita and uh, Bella and Chloe, going to be with us for a little while, so we're just so blessed that you are here. And for all of our guests and visitors we are glad that you're here to worship this morning, again, on a beautiful Father's Day. Um, just a couple of things. One, we had a great uh, movie night last night. We watched We Bought a Zoo in here. We were hoping to be outside, but the wind kicked up and it got a little chilly. So we, instead of doing a drive-in, we did the movie in here. But it was our first attempt, and it went very, very well. So we were really pleased with the, the turnout we had last night. And hopefully we'll be uh, looking at another movie um, sometime in July, we hope. We'll see how that goes. Um, there will be no uh, study tonight because it's Father's Day, so there will not be a study. But I also want to encourage you uh, on Wednesdays from 12 to 1 or thereabouts uh, after we have a lunch bunch. So you bring a bag lunch and uh, a drink and we have a lunch and a, a Bible study. We just cracked open Philemon, that beautiful letter. And so it's a nice little gathering, but... We're hoping to get people back out. A lot of times folks can't drive at night anymore, so we're providing opportunities during the day. So please take some time. To, if you want to, come on out. And if you forget a bag lunch, we've got a couple that are packed here that we pack fresh that day. Don't worry, they're not in the fridge for you. So uh, <laughs> we'll have something. Although we do have some leftover hot dogs, I think, from last night. So you never know what you might get in popcorn. But anyway, that said, Tori, would you open us in prayer this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day and for everyone who is here who has come to meet together to worship you. We thank you so much, Father, for the fact that you are our Heavenly Father and you are a good, good Father. And you love us so much and um, we love you in return, Lord. And we thank you so much that you have adopted us into your family, that we can cry, Abba, Father, because we have been adopted into your heavenly family. It's such a beautiful thing. So we thank you for that, Lord, and I pray that we would rejoice out of our hearts in that um, amazing thing that Jesus has grafted us into your family. I pray that you would bless this time of worship, that we would be able to lay all of our burdens at your feet and come before you with singing. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all sing, stand together as we sing, Good, Good Father.
know as we come to our time of prayer this morning, we certainly want to lift up fathers today, godly fathers. The, the land needs godly fathers, again, men of integrity and character, of godly character. And the world also needs moms and dads again, moms and dads of godly character. We're playing, praying for a family down in Greenfield this morning um, who is going to be foster parents. They're taking in a 17-month-old child, and uh, they've never done it before. But thank God for moms and dads who take in foster children. Thank God. For the adoption centers, Lord, thank, thank you for those people who desire to have children. And God, forgive us this morning for setting on the highest of mountains of legislation this heinous and egregious sin of abortion. For young couples who are not blessed to be able to have children, have the opportunities, Lord, to, to love children by adoption. And we thank you, Father, that we are adopted as your sons and daughters because of Jesus Christ. How precious adoption is. We thank you, Lord, for foster parents. And Lord, we think of even Joseph the foster father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, Lord, in this land, we have, we have for way too long said that killing a child, a child who is unborn, is the law of the land. God help us. And how I pray we would repent of that sin. Lord, for the leaders who have such, such, such things, Father, how I pray that there would be a turnabout in this legislation, especially in this own, our own state, Lord. Our governor has become the queen of abortion. And Lord, until the legislation is overturned and is no longer the law of the land, I pray, Father, that you trouble those people's hearts that they get no sleep. I pray, Father, they hear the cries of the unborn and they're troubled so much until they have nothing left to do but to turn to you and repent of this sin and you lead them to change the laws of this land and above all to salvation. Father, this morning as we come together, we, we know that there are still many who are, who are sick. There are many, Lord, who cannot get out of their homes because they are aged now. And where they used to be able to come and fellowship with us, they can no longer do that. Strengthen them in these days, Lord, and how I pray that especially for those who are in the nursing homes, that we will once again have the freedom to go and to conduct services there in those nursing homes, to be able to, to visit freely and to encourage those who were once part of this fellowship and other fellowships around this community. And Lord, I pray you provide a way that perhaps even for those who can no longer drive, Lord, you provide a way that we can be able to, to, to have a ministry to go out and to pick up those who, who do not have transportation, who can no longer drive, Lord, and, and bring them here, that they can worship you, and, and Lord, they can, they can sing praises to you and be encouraged by this body of Christ. Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning you've given to us. Lord, we thank you for the, the blessing of the surprise of the Woodwards being here today. What a joy to see that family come, come marching in in the parking lot, Lord. It brings back so many memories. And yet, Lord, we, we bless you and we thank you for the addition of Caleb. You've joined he and Israel together. And now, Father, you have opened up her womb for the blessing of a little child. And we pray your protection upon Israel and this blessed little baby, a miracle made with your own hands. And we pray, Father, um, for all to be well, and we look forward, we look forward to hearing the news of the day that the miracle of God has been born to this precious man and woman, a husband and wife. Lord, we uh, thank you again. 
for being able to come uninhibited this morning, free of persecution, and to sing praises to you and to, and to pray and to, to open up your word this morning. Father, I pray we never take it for granted. Oh God, how we never take the gathering together as the body of Christ for granted. For one day there will be a famine in the land. And the famine will be the word of God. Until that time, Lord, how I pray that we never, ever, ever lose sight of this precious gift that you have given to us, the body of Christ, and to fellowship with one another. And now, Lord, as we continue to worship you, I pray your word goes forth with might and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, you touch all of our hearts with it to your glory and that change would take place. And Lord, if there be one here who has gone to their far off country, bring them back to you, Lord, and let them be a testimony in Jesus' name. So this morning, my sister, if you have a bulletin, you will see that her name's in there. And unfortunately, she wasn't feeling good this morning, so she wasn't able to join me. Um, but I'm going to play the arrangement on my own. Uh, it's, it, this is my father's world. It's probably a familiar hymn tune for many of you. But real quickly, I just want to share, because as, we as we were praying, I, I just felt the Lord impressing upon me that just the fact that every one of us has our own different stories in terms of our relationship with our earthly fathers and some of us have been blessed with amazing fathers that we um, are just very blessed to have and they're good fathers and they know how to show, show the love of the, our heavenly father to us but some of us do not have good fathers and we have difficult situations and and the, the way that we have our relationship with our earthly father tends to impact the way that we see our heavenly father so my prayer for you for those of you who have struggled with this because of your relationship with your earthly father, or maybe you have, your father hasn't been around at all. Um, my prayer for you is today that you'll be able to be freed from those areas that are impacting you and how you see your heavenly father, because he loves you so much, and he is a perfect father, and he's a good father. And he, and um, even, even, those of us, even those of us with good fathers, the flaws in our fathers on earth will tend to impact the way that we see him. So my prayer for you today is that you will be able to be freed from any of those um, blinders that are in front of you to being able to see our Heavenly Father and His great love for you and how His arms are always open and He is always available and always present and never distant.
Well, if you have a copy of God's Word, would you turn to Luke chapter 15. I have preached this many times, and you have heard it preached many times, I'm sure. But I want to talk with you this morning and bring this to you, that there is not just one prodigal son. But I would submit to you that in the story of Luke 15, that there are prodigal sons. Both of these boys are wayward boys. When we look at the story, we tend to look at one and one alone. Because he's the one where the focus is, right? I mean, he's the one who says to his dad, give me everything. He's the one who takes off. He's the one who squanders everything. He's the one who finds himself in the pig pen. He's the one who has to repent and confess of his sin. It seems to be all about this younger son. And nobody is ever paying attention to the older son. In fact, I would submit to you that the older son's sins are just as, if not more, dangerous than the younger son's sins. But this is not even a story about sin. It's not a story of the, the sin of the young son or the sin of the older son. In Luke 15, whether it be the parable of the lost sheep or the parable of the lost coin or the parable of the prodigal son, it's one parable and it's all about lostness. This is the underlying theme here. Everything, you have a sheep that's lost, a coin that's lost. And the truth is, both of these sons are lost. Both of them. But in the midst of this, we see the most beautiful picture. As Tori was sharing in, in her encouraging words, we see this beautiful picture of the heart of a loving father toward both of these sons. And that's what I want to talk to you today about, the heart of our Heavenly Father. So when we, we see this story unfolding, and we'll get to the scripture in just a moment, one of the things that's interesting between the two boys in this um, biblical truth is this. The young boy knew exactly what he wanted. And he went for it. And the truth is, this young son, I mean, in my experience in law enforcement, I never had anyone that I encountered that woke up in the morning and said, you know what? It's a beautiful day. Today, I think I'll start stealing. Or today, I think I'll just beat the snot out of somebody I don't know. Or I'll assault or I'll, I'll kill somebody. They just don't wake up. You don't wake up and do that. There are signs along the way that lead up to this. It always happens. I've never had a case where anybody, there were no indications. So I'm sure that for this young son, there are indications that he wanted to get out of dad's house. He wanted to go somewhere else because he wasn't satisfied with being home. What was it about this young boy? What is it about us if we identify with the younger son here, here it is. He loved sin. He loved it. And of course he loved it. Because it was providing for him, he thought, what he needed. This was his appetite. He was feeding on the stuff that satisfied his appetite. He didn't have an appetite for what his father was providing for him. Didn't want to eat that at all. No, he wanted what was offered outside of his father's home. That's where his, his appetite was. Because things had gotten before his eyes. Things had come into his ears. And he was hearing things and he was seeing things that were hypnotizing him. They were attractive to him. And he says, this is what I want. That was his appetite. This is what he wanted to feed himself on. What he did not want anymore, what he no longer had, was an appetite for the Father's provisions. He did not, he no longer wanted the security of the Father's home. 
He no longer wanted the provision of the father's boundaries that he set up. And he no longer wanted his father's guidance. He was out there on his own. No, the older son is different. He likes being home. And there's a reason why he likes being home. You would initially think that the older son really loved his father, but he didn't. In fact, I would submit to you that the older son liked being home because he knew how he could manage his father. He figured out a way how he could just keep dad in the palm of his hands and dad wouldn't see the other things that really were in his heart. The older son was too much in love with himself. This is the only person that he really wanted to please was himself and we're going to see that borne out. One of the most dangerous sins that we have is pride and it's born out of self-centeredness the older son was a prideful self-centered boy or young man and so here are these pictures of two sinful men who have been victimized by sin who are deluded and deceived by sin and rebelling against the loving constraint of their father. But more important, we see the portrait of a loving father who responds to both of the sons in due time, who waits for the loving return of the prodigal sons, both of them. And so in Luke 15, let's look at the scripture together. And he said there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. And before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and left and, 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 and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, the older brother. Oh, here he is. And he's in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked, What these things mean? said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father comes out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. That's an interesting statement there. I don't know how many of us here would get excited about having a young goat to celebrate with our friends. But if you go to a few towns north of here, they do. 
But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, how do you know that? You killed a fattened calf for him. He said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. First thing I want to share with you today is the far country is not determined by distance. The far country is not determined by distance. You don't have to go very far in sin to be away from God. One sinning son travels a far distance away. I mean, he packs his bags and he's gone. The other night when we were um, at Lottie Flewelling's service, one of her sons got up and he gave a beautiful testimony of how he went to college and he was 300 miles away from home. He didn't have, there was no cell phones and, and there was no internet or no computer back then. And he was living like a hellion. He was involved in everything. And he knew his mother or father couldn't get to him. But every week she wrote him a letter. And in that letter there was a scripture verse. And let him know that she was praying for him. And sure enough, before he finished off his college, he came to his senses. And he came to the Lord. He was a long distance away from his mom and dad, wasn't he? 300 miles. Sometimes people will travel far away to begin their life of sin. But the younger son here just traveled around his father's property. He didn't go hundreds of miles away. He didn't go to this far country anywhere. And the truth here is this. Anywhere a person is away from Almighty God is the far country. That is our far country. Wherever we are not in fellowship with Almighty God, our life is a far country. And God says, you don't belong there. This is not where I put you. Both sons in this story want to do one thing and one thing alone. They want to please themselves. That's their goal. And that is the principle, though, of the far country, is it not? It's self-gratification. It's pleasing myself. When you look at the scriptures here and you begin to separate them apart, you can take both of these brothers, both of these sons, and there is this movie that is being cast, this motion picture, and it's, it's constantly moving ahead. The younger son begins it, and he begins with, Father, give me. That's how it starts off. So, father's got two older boys, and the first one comes to him and says, Father, you give me. And so we see that he gathered all that he had that was given to him, and he goes to a distant country. While he's there, he squanders his whole estate in foolish living. He spent everything. And then after that, what do we see? He's out of money, he's out of friends, and now what? Famine hits. Hard times come, and he has got nothing, and he has got no one. He's hungry. The Bible says he longs to fill his stomach, but no one gave him anything. And so here he is in the pig pen, and he's eating the same thing that the pigs eat, the carob pods there. No one would give him anything. Now we get to the, toward the end of the Scripture. And we see this life of the son. And now he comes to his senses and he's coming back home. And the father sees him coming and he runs out. We're going to get to the father a little bit later. But let's look at the older son. Let's look at his character here in this movie. He became angry. Wow. He did not want to go in. His father says, son, come on into the house. Not going in. No way am I going in that house. His father pleads with him. Instead of the father saying, okay, I'll pick up a word from last night's movie, whatever. 
He doesn't say that. He begins to plead with the older son. And this is the reply that the older son gives to the father. I have been slaving. I have never disobeyed your orders. But you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. This son that you're celebrating in, that house with, and he says, your son, not my brother, but this your son, he has devoured everything that you gave him. He has ruined everything that you gave him. He has taken all of the assets that you gave him, Dad, all that money that you worked so hard for, that we worked so hard for, and he went out and he partied, and he had prostitutes. Wow. But when we look at this older brother, sometimes we think of, oh, the older brother, that poor guy. I mean, you think about that young son of his, and that young son is just a hellion, and I, I can understand the older brother. He was working hard. Bull feathers. Plain and simple. And the truth is this. We have all received of our Heavenly Father. Every single one of us. And there's not one person sitting here today that at one particular point in time in our life, and maybe it wasn't that long ago, even this morning, that we were not living at the center of who we are. Self-centered and have no compassion in our hearts for people who are behaving like the younger son. Well, the far country, though, has a couple of different roads. I always share this story, and I'll share it again as an introduction to this particular one. When I was a young boy and I was fishing with my dad, I was about five or six years old, and we would go, there's a place called the Tin Roof, and it was a reservoir. There was always fish in the reservoir there. So my dad and I went fishing. And, and as we were there for a while, I mean, I'm five or six years old, I can remember it. I close my eyes and still see me sitting there on the edge of the Tin Roof with my father holding a fishing pole. But I had a toy in the car. I was a G.I. Joe or something like that, Right? Where's my man sitting back there? There it is. I still got the soldier. All right. Still got it, Nikki. It's still there. So, <laughs> so I said to my father, you know, Dad, can I go get the G.I. Joe or the Captain America doll, whatever? And my dad said to me, sure. Now, back then, you didn't have to wear bike helmets for everything or knee pads or buckle into the car. No, nothing like that, okay? And, in fact, kids were allowed to actually go out on their own. So my father said, look, here is this road right here, this, this path. You stay on that path. You will come to the car, get what you want, and come right back to me. He didn't leave the fishing poles and say, hang on, I got to go with you. And I went. And sure enough, exactly as my father told me, I stayed on that path, and I got what I wanted out of the car. I turned around, but here's the problem. What was one path, there was now another path. And I could not remember what path I got back to get on. So here I am, a young boy that went off without my father. I have my father's directions, but guess what? I'm away from him now. And now he's not there to say, take this path. And now I'm out on my own. And I have to make my own decision. And guess what? The decision I made was not the right decision. I began to walk back on the other path. And it wasn't long before I realized I was not on the same path. And so what did I do? I began to cry out to my father. Just being like, Dad! Dad! And I mean, I'm in the woods. And it was only probably a few seconds, but it seemed like a long time. I could hear my father calling back. I hear you. Stay where you are. He didn't say, I'm over here. He said, I hear you, stay where you are. My father knew something. I was lost. I was on the wrong road. And the only way that I could get back to my father was that my father had to come and get me. 
while I was still a long way off, my earthly father came to me. And while this young man was a long way off, his father saw him and his father ran to him and came to him. That's the heart of our heavenly father. If we would just stop where we are on whatever road we are that is away from God, it doesn't matter if it's just, for me, it was just a short distance away. Or for like the son that we're reading of was hundreds of miles away. Or for Alan who spoke of when he was in college, hundreds of miles away. It doesn't matter. When we cry out to our Heavenly Father, he just says, stop. Don't go any further. I am coming for you. That is the heart of a Heavenly Father. That's our Heavenly Father. That's that good, good Father. That's who he is. Verse 13, 12 and 13, we, we see these, these different roads here. And we see how the, the young son has, is departing. He's the kind whose lostness is apparent, as I said earlier. It was obvious to everybody around there. I mean, hey, where'd Johnny go? He's not here anymore. Where'd he go? Eh, you know, he didn't want to be here anymore, so he packed his bags. Really? Does he have a job? No, nah, he doesn't. He just, he's gone. He, is, he doesn't want to be here, okay? He's gone. He's not home. What was he not doing? He wasn't working. It's like he, he left for a job or to go to college. He goes to this place with no job at all. And if he's not working, it means something else. He's wasting his life. And that's what he was doing. At home, he worked on the farm with his father and his brother. There, what were they doing? Well, they're cultivating. They're growing things, right? They're creating. Now he's somewhere else where he's not working, but he's wasting. There's no creation going on anymore. In fact, he has no clue that this is happening to him because he's so involved in life and all of his buddies who really just want him because of his money, but he has no idea but he is destroying himself. He is on a path to destruction. The only thing that is being created is destruction in his life. That's it. But why did he go? I mean, who would want to... Look, if, if dad's got the money like that to give to both of the sons, stick around. I mean, hey, working on a farm. Maybe dad will get caught up in a plow or a mule or kick him or something like that and we'll get the money. But he doesn't. He takes off. Why? Because he has one thing and one thing in mind. I can't get what I want here. I'm going out to get what I want there. Self-pleasure. Self-gratification. This is what he is doing. So focused on pleasing himself. He has no idea what's coming his way. And the other thing that's so selfish about this young son is this. He has no idea about the pain that it will cause him, but also the pain that will cause his father, relatives that he has, friends in the community. He has no idea at the essence of sin is self-gratification. That is sin. Somebody asks you, what is sin? Self-gratification. And it costs every time. Every time. What did it cost him? He's no longer in fellowship with his father. He's gone. Right? And think about living at home. Sometimes for young kids, right? Just can't wait to get out of this town. Just can't wait to make it on my own. Right? Until you really find out that, hmm, I'd much rather be home right now. Home is really a good place to be. But it cost him his, this is the satire here. It cost him his freedom. He left to be free and instead became a slave. Wow. And that's what happens to a lot of people. They run away from what they have thinking that they're going to be free and instead they enslave themselves. And the interesting thing about what changes in this story is, is that when he goes to his father at the beginning of Luke 15, he says to his father, give me 
But after he's starving and he's dead broke, now he comes back and what does he say to his father? Make me. Wow. What a change in life. Give me. Dad, make me as one of your hired servants. Completely changed. Cost him everything. So we see his departure. But look at the downfall. When he reaches the far country, what does he do? He gets a job. Nope, doesn't do that. He goes and finds a church and gets himself some, somebody who's a good, godly man who can help him with financial counseling. Nope, doesn't do that. Doesn't do anything to plan for the life that he wants. Instead, he's got really heavy pockets full of stuff. So, most likely, he probably went, found the casino, found the booze, and found the girls. And guess what? He's got money. So somebody else is standing around and said, hey, this boy's got some money over here. Hey, man, how you doing? Nice to meet you. All of a sudden, friends are coming around. I mean, he's got money. And he's here. yeah, no problem at all. Hey, give Bob a drink over there. No, it's on me. What? I'll take care of his dinner. That's no problem at all. He was the big shot. We used to use that term a long time ago. He's a big shot. I was sharing earlier, my, my mother used to say that to my father. Stop playing a big shot. Right? My dad was, oh, that's no problem. I'll, I'll take care of it. Stop playing the big shot. You don't have any money, she would say to him. But what did it get? Because friends would come, people would come around. He's the big shot. I want to hang out with him. This is what's happening with this boy. He's the big shot in town until he wasn't anymore. And so now he makes no plan for life at all. No job, no education, no financial planning, no budget. He just does whatever he wants to do. And he wastes his substance. It isn't that he just wasted his father's money or now he calls it his. He wasted himself. The very substance of who he is, he was wasting. Because the, the, the truth, the biblical truth in this, in this story here is this. This boy is seen going out from God to waste his substance. In other words, he joins himself to a citizen, not to God. And when he joins himself to the citizen, what does the citizen do? Yeah, get into the fields and start feeding my pigs. Oh, okay, I can do that. Now this, this guy who hires him, this citizen, doesn't say to him, hey, look, when you get up in the morning, before you go to the fields, don't worry about it. Um, my wife will have breakfast for you. Or, hey, here's a, here's a bag of lunch to go out to the field with. I want to make sure you're all set. And come on off the field and come into the house and get cleaned up for dinner. And we're going to have dinner after. Nope. Just said that a boy go out in the field and work. You feed the pigs. I'm kind of hungry. Hey, could I? And the Bible says no one gave him anything. Where were all his friends? Where'd they go? They're gone. And all he has is the same food that the pigs were eating. His whole substance was being wasted away because he left the fellowship of God and joined himself to a citizen of the world. And this guy could care less about this young man. All he says is, you know what? He's nothing more than a machine for me. That's all he is to me, each for himself, and when he fails, he will die. So be it, I'll get another one to come here. That is what the far country has for anyone who wants to go there. That's it. There is nothing real or life-sustaining about it. It is an illusion. The far country gives you nothing. The far country has zero pity 
for you. The far country has absolutely no sympathy, no empathy, no help whatsoever. But the older son, a little bit of his attitude here, he reveals that his years of obedience to his father had really not been of devotion for his father. There was no loving service for his father that at all. His whole mindset was a complete lack of sympathy. In fact, you could almost say that encapsulated within the older son is the far off country. He had no sympathy. He had no, he had no empathy. Nothing at all. He refers to his brother, not as his brother, but he refers to him as your son. There's no mention of prostitutes until this boy mentions prostitutes. He didn't travel to a far off country with his younger brother. How did he know that his younger brother was squandering money with prostitutes? There's nothing ever mentioned about it until this guy mentions prostitutes. Hmm. See, here's the thing. The younger son, and we're not justifying it, he knew what he wanted. The younger son, the older one wanted the same thing. He just didn't have it in him to go do it. He's a fraud. And that's who he really is. He's nothing more than a fraud. But he accuses his brother, and this is the dangerous thing. He accuses his brother of sins that he longed to do. He just didn't have the spine to do it. He didn't have a heart for God. And that's what we do sometimes, don't we? We accuse people of things that we really want to do. That's what we do. We're going to get there in just one moment because I'm not going to go through the whole thing here. I don't have time today and it's Father's Day. So, but I just want you to see this business of the son in verse 25. There are those who are just lost like this elder son. But his type are hardly regarded as being lost either by themselves or others. Because why? This makes the, well, this makes their condition even more hopeless when you think of it. He's not away in a distant land. He's not with pigs. He's just lost. He is. He's in an environment that is clean and good. It's a great environment he has. Now, the elder son was in the field. Unlike his brother, let's just contrast this. He's not wasting like his brother. He's working in the field. He's working, he's laboring in the field. That deserves respect. Socially, he had not brought shame to his father. And I imagine the mom is still there in the home. We just don't read of her. There's no social shame. He resists all the temptation to the, to the physical indulgences that his brother is out doing. He is energetic, apparently. He's, he's a hardworking guy. He's prudent. He doesn't like laziness. He's the enemy of extravagance. He conducts, his conduct creates no shame there. If there's moral carelessness, he hates it. He doesn't gamble. He condemned lawlessness. He required himself to despise immorality. And therefore, he is entitled to all the credit that was due him. But here's the problem. He missed the characteristics of his father's life. That's what he missed. He missed the characteristics of his father's life. His father was a long-suffering man. His father is a merciful man. His father was a man who was grieving over his younger son's time away from from home. And this older son knew nothing of compassion. He knew nothing of mercy. He knew nothing of long suffering or patience. This man 
His heart had been so frozen by self-centeredness that he lacked understanding and compassion. His brother was a tarnished sinner in his eyes, and he was a righteous man in his own eyes. His brother deserved nothing but to be reprimanded and to be hurt by what he did. But he deserved the party. He deserved the praise, and he deserved the honor. And you know what? He became an utter stranger to what his brother had suffered because of his sin. And he's outraged by that. Scripture testifies that. He is, no, is out of sympathy. Zero for his brother. Zero for his father. His father grieves over the reality that his son's in the far country. But the older son could care less where his brother is. It's of no importance. When the younger son returns, the father rejoices greatly. But there is no joy on the part of the older son. He has no love for his father. He has no love for his brother. I want to stop there this morning. And so you see, it's not a prodigal son that we're learning about today. It's prodigal sons. Both boys are lost. Here's the danger. We, who at one time in our lives, were all prodigals. And along the way, the Spirit of God visited us. And made us sorrowful for what we were doing. And he's the one who brought us to our senses. This man didn't come to his senses on his own. God brought him to his senses. You and I don't come to our sense of sin on our own. God brings that to mind. And God is the one who calls us to repentance. And so in any time a person repents... It's God who's producing repentance in us. We don't do it on our own. And confession of sin takes place. That's God producing that in us. Because God is in charge of all of all salvation. We have nothing to do with saving ourselves. Not one moment of it. If I grieve over my sin, God's made me godly sorrowful. Or I've opened up his word, God's made me God godly sorrowful. Or I've sat with another brother or sister in Christ and you've said to me, hey... You're going to a far off country here. And as a result of that, those words that you're speaking to me, because you're speaking truth, God's made me godly sorrowful because it's a Christian who is speaking and the Spirit of God is speaking through you. And that leads to repentance. God's causing the repentance. And that leads to confession of sin. God is the one who does all of that. I'm in charge of not. He's the one. He's a good, good father. That's who he is. And he runs to us. But here's the danger. Of all of us who have gone through this and continue to be sanctified, if you will, to grow closer, to be more like Christ, here's the danger for us. Stop being the prodigal son, so to speak, the young son, without turning into the older son. We lose sight of what God's done in our life as the younger son. And so all of a sudden, when we look at someone who becomes the younger son or the younger daughter, we now become like the elder and say, they deserve it. They should have known better. How stupid. How can they do such a thing? Uh-oh. We have just lost sight that we were not too long ago that younger son, that younger daughter. We've lost sight of the heart of our heavenly father. And so when God saves us, the prodigals, we should have the heart of our heavenly father to have mercy and compassion and long-suffering 
and forgiveness. To water down the sin? No. Jesus never did that. But to never ever look at someone and say, I'm better than you. Look at me. And some of you are sitting here today And you don't think God can forgive you. And maybe someone's lied to you about the grace of Jesus Christ. I don't know. And maybe you think that I'm, I'm beyond this forgiveness. I'm here to tell you, no. Some of you are thinking, well, you know what? You have no idea of how I've broken the heart of God. Yes, I do. I most assuredly do now. But I'll tell you something. You can never break his love. Never. And that is borne out in our lives. So I'll close with this. I don't share it often. But when I do, it's hard to get through. God has a unique way of revealing that you can be the elder son. A number of years ago, when I first started pastoring, my very first pastoring, I wasn't there but a couple of months. And here comes this young woman. I was at the church. And here comes this young woman. And unlike you, Israel, she's out to here. And she's ready. And she said to me, hi, my name is so-and-so. And, -so, and um, my fiance and I would like to get married here. And so I said, well, I never met them before. And so I says, well, I'd like to meet your fiance and we can come and she says, well, I'm going to have the baby real soon, and I don't want to have this baby unless I get married. She says, and we want to be married in the church, and my mom and dad are members of the church here. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I've never met this young girl before, and, but I've only been here a couple of months. So possible, maybe they, they were away. Who knows? So I says, what's your, what's your last name, your mom and dad's name? And they, she told me the name. I said, I don't recognize that name at all. I was, I'm pretty good with names. So uh, I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, I want to talk with you and your fiancé. And she said, well, he's not a Christian, so... Um, yeah, we just want to get married. And I says, well, I'm sorry. I said, but I, I, can't, I can't do that. In other words, I, we can't have the big walk down the aisle and the big ceremony and all the other stuff. I says, but I'll tell you what I will do. I says, you bring your fiancé to my office, I says, and we'll talk. And I says, and, and you know what? I says, you can go to the justice of the peace. You can get married there, and then you can have the baby. We'll have time for counseling. And I says, and, and, and the Lord willing, maybe your, your fiancé will come to the Lord and and so she began to just tear up, and she sobbed, and she left. Well, that night, the deacons called me. <laughs> it wasn't even too long. She went home, told her mom and dad. Her mom and dad were not members of the church. They had been a long, long time ago. And so I said, well, I explained the thing. I said, no, we understand. And about several months after that, I was told, hey, I hear there's uh, so-and-so is getting married at the church. And they told me, I said, oh, it's news to me. Well, no, you're not going to be officiating that. But, And this young woman was living with another man and uh, had a child. But now they just wanted to come to the church and get married. And they were going to call the former pastor to do the marriage. I said, absolutely not. That ain't happening here. Well, guess what? That family left the church and God just does some things. People say, well, you know what? This is what you stand for. You're, you're right. You know what? Yeah, you know what? I mean, come on. What do you... Until. It happened with you. You see, the far off country is also making decisions without sitting down and saying, God, 
What am I going to do here? Here's a young woman. I, I know what's going on in her heart. Here's another one. What, what, what can we do here? It's pretty amazing until God says, well, you're going to learn by experience. And for those of you who think that pastors are exempt from life, you're wrong. My daughter got married right out of high school. She married her quote-unquote high school sweetheart. We had no idea of the abuse she was going through, but she was. She concealed it well. She married him, and he was in the service, and she moved to Colorado. She wasn't there a month before the call came in. He was arrested for beating her, and she was coming home. It was over with. While she was home, another young man who she knew in school met her. He claimed to be his, her protector and everything else. And well, fast forward several months, and Patty said, Ashley needs to talk with you. She's married. She's not divorced. There's been no counseling. And she's crying. What's the matter, honey? She said, I'm pregnant. And I thought, well, are you, didn't know you were back with your husband. And she says, I'm not. Now she's the child of another man. And she says, Dad, what do I do? What do I do? She says, I know how you feel about it. But she says, Dad, what do I do? You're pastoring a church. It wasn't the same one. It was a different one now. In fact, the one I'm pastoring right now down in Greenfield. I was there on my first tour. She said, this is going to bring a whole lot of problems to you. To mom. And I said to her, son, honey, you know what you need to do. She says, I thought that's what you said. My grandson's going to be 13. But I said this to her. She said she was sorry. I said, honey, I want to share something with you. You can break my heart. But you can't break my love. It's impossible. And that's what our Heavenly Father says to us. You may have broken my heart, but you will never break my love for you. And so she ended up getting married. This man became our son-in-law. And then... I had the opportunity to baptize a couple with their kids. Until Patty came home and said to me, Frank, did you know they're not married? God has a sense of humor. I said, no, didn't know it. And so she shared it at the women's group. I called them up and they said, we've been meaning to call you too. Now, Remember the first story I shared with you. I said to that young couple, either you separate, and if you don't separate, I'm not marrying you. That was, that was, that was it. You do it this way. Now what do you do? Oh, it's amazing how God teaches you to seek his counsel. They have a family. So we got together, and the sin was burdening them. They had come to Christ, and so now they, this isn't right. We've got to be married. 
And so they said, we've asked God for forgiveness, but what are we going to do? And here's what my answer was. Alan, for the next six weeks, because I'm going to counsel you, you and, and his wife, for the next six weeks, your bed is the couch. You can hold her hand and you can kiss her, but you let go of one another. I won't be peeking in your windows at night, but you will make that promise with God. And they made that promise and they were faithful to it. You see, I could have said to that young couple, you have a child. What can I do? How could you separate? But you make a commitment to the Lord. You separate from one another. Because the lie is this. Living together is the sin. It's not living together. There are a lot of people who live in colleges together. They don't have any sex at all. It's sexual immorality is the sin. I share all of that. To say be very careful. That you don't become. The elder son who looks down upon others because of what they have done. Without the counsel of God, without having the heart of compassion and the mercy and the long suffering and forgiveness of God. Otherwise, you too, like me, will find yourself in a far country, but behaving as the elder son. Thank God for the loving heart of our heavenly father who rescues us from all of that. To God be the glory. Tori, would you come and lead us out? Well, let's stand and sing together.
happy Father's Day again. On the way out, there is a special gift from a special lady. So uh, make sure you, you stop and, and get one. She probably want a kiss from you too, guys. I don't know for sure, but I'm behind glass. <laughs> but now unto him who is able to do immeasurably above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works within us. Be glory in the church in Christ Jesus through all generations. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Happy.